everybody. Hello to my three viewers, Zoe, Audrey, and Megan. We are going to get started on chapter 19. The chariot race ends with a bang. We arrived in Long Island after Clarice, thanks to the centaur's travel powers. I rode on Chiron's back, but we didn't talk much, especially not about Kronos. I knew it had been difficult for Chiron to tell me, and I didn't want to push him with more questions. I mean, I've met plenty of embarrassing parents, but Kronos, the evil titan lord who wanted to destroy Western civilization, not the kind of dad you invited to a school for a career day. When we got to the camp, the centaurs were anxious to meet Dionysus. They'd heard he threw some really wild parties, but they were disappointed. The wine god was in no mood to celebrate as the whole camp gathered at the top of Half-Blood Hill. The camp had been through a hard two weeks. The arts and crafts cabin had burned to the ground from an attack by a Draco Ionis, which as near as I could figure was Latin for a really big lizard with breath that blows up stuff. The big house rooms are overflowing with wounded. The kids in the Apollo cabin, who were the best healers, had been working overtime performing first aid. Everybody looked weary and battered as the crowd around as they we crowded around Thalia's tree. The moment Clary draped the golden fleece over the lowest bough, the moonlight seemed to brighten, turning from gray to silver. A cool breeze rustled in the branches and rippled through the grass all the way into the valley. Everything came into sharper focus. The glow of the fireflies down in the woods, the smell of the strawberry fields, the sound of the waves on the beach. Gradually, the needles on the pine tree started turning from brown to green. Everybody cheered. It was happening slowly, but there could be no doubt. The fleece's magic was seeping into the tree, filling it with new power and expelling the poison. Chiron ordered a 24-7 guard duty on the hilltop, at least until he could find an appropriate monster to protect the fleece. He said he'd place was carried on her cabin mate's shoulders down to the amphitheater, where she was honored with a laurel wreath and a lot of celebrating around the campfire. Nobody gave me or Annabeth a second look. It was as if we never left. In a way, I guess I was best, I guess that was the best thank you anybody could have given us, because if they admitted we'd snuck out of camp to do a quest, they'd have to expel us. And really, I didn't need any more attention. It felt good to just be one of the campers for once. Later that night, as we were roasting s'mores and listening to the Stoll brothers tell us about a ghost story of an evil king who was eaten alive by a demonic breakfast pastry, Clary showed me from behind, shut me from behind, and whispered in my ear, "Just because we were cool one time, Jackson, don't think you're off the hook with Aries. I'm still waiting for the right opportunity to pulverize you." I gave her a grudging smile. "What?" she demanded. "Nothing," I said. "Just good to be home." The next morning, after the party pony is headed back to Florida, Chiron made a surprise announcement. The chariot races would go ahead as scheduled. We'd all figured they were history now that Tantalus was gone, but completing them did feel like the right thing to do, especially now that Chiron was back and the camp was safe. Tyson wasn't too keen on the idea of getting back in a chariot after our first experience, but he was happy to let me team up with Annabeth. I would drive and Annabeth would defend, and Tyson would act as our pit crew while I worked with the horses. Tyson picked up an Athena's chariot and added a whole bunch of special modifications. We spent the next two days training like crazy. Annabeth and I agreed that if we won, the prize of no chores for the rest of the month would be split between our two cabins. Since Athena had more campers, they would get most of us, giving them a final brushing. When somebody right behind me said, fine animals, horses, which I thought of them. A middle-aged guy in a postal carrier outfit was leaning against the stable door. He was slim with curly black hair under his white pitch helmet, and he had a mailbag slung over his shoulder. Hermes, I stammered. Hello, Percy. Didn't recognize me with my jogging without my jogging clothes. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to kneel or buy stamps from him or what. Then it occurred to me why he must be here. Oh, listen, Lord Hermes, about Luke. The god arched his eyebrows. Uh, we saw him all right, I said, but you weren't able to talk some sense into him? Well, we kind of tried to kill each other in a duel to the death. I see. You tried the diplomatic approach. I'm really sorry. I mean, you gave us those awesome gifts and everything, and I know you really wanted Luke to come back. But he's turned bad. Really bad. He said he feels like you abandoned him. I waited for Hermes to get angry. I figured he'd turn me into a hamster or something, and I did not want to spend any more time as a rodent. Instead, he just sighed. Do you ever feel like your father abandoned you, Percy? Oh, man. 
I wanted to say, only a few hundred times a day. Then it spoke to Poseidon this last summer. I'd never even been to his underwater palace, and there was this whole thing about with Tyson. No warning, no explanation, just boom, you have a brother. I think that deserved a little heads up, a phone call or something. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got and realized I did want recognition for the quest. I'd completed, but not from the other campers. I wanted from my, I wanted my dad to say something, to notice me. Hermes readjusted the mailbag on his shoulder. Percy, the hardest part about being a god is that you must often act indirectly, especially when it comes to your own children. If we were to intervene every time he has answered your prayers, I can only hope that someday Luke may realize the same about me. Whether you feel like you succeeded or not, you reminded Luke who he was. You spoke to him. I tried to kill him. Hermes shrugged. Families are messy. Immortal families are eternally messy. Sometimes the best we can do is remind each other that we're related, for better or worse. And uh, try to keep the maiming and killing to a minimum. It didn't sound like much of a recipe for the perfect family. Then again, as I thought about my quest, I realized maybe Hermes was right. Poseidon had sent the Hippocampi to help us. He'd given me powers over the sea that I'd no never known about before. And there was Tyson. Had Poseidon brought us together on purpose? How many times had Tyson saved my life this summer? In the distance, the conch horn sounded, signaling curfew. You should get to bed, Hermes said. I've helped, quite enough, I've helped you get into quite enough trouble this summer already. I really only came to make this delivery. A delivery? I am the messenger of the gods, Percy. He took an electronic signature pad from his mailbag and handed it to me. Sign there, please. I picked up the stylus before realizing it was entwined with a pair of tiny green snakes. Ugh. I dropped the pad. Ouch, said George. Really, Percy, Martha scolded. Would you want to be dropped on the floor of a horse stable? Oh, uh, sorry. Didn't much like touching snakes, but I picked up the pad and stylus again. Martha and George wriggled under my fingers, forming a kind of pencil grip like the ones my special ed teacher made me use in second grade. Did you bring me a rat? George asked. No, I said, oh, we didn't find any. What about a guinea pig? George, Martha chided, don't tease the boy. I signed my name and gave the pad back to Hermes. In exchange, he handed me a sea blue envelope. My fingers trembled. Even before I opened it, I could tell it was from my father. I could sense his power in the cool blue paper, as if the envelope itself had been folded out of an ocean wave. Good luck tomorrow, Herbie said. Fine team of horses you have there. Though you'll excuse me if I root for the Hermes cabin. And don't be too discouraged when you read it, dear, Martha told me. He does have your interests at heart. What do you mean, I asked. Don't mind her, George said. And next time, remember, snakes work for tips. Enough, you two, Hermes said. Goodbye, Percy, for now. Small white wings sprouted from his pitch helmet, pith helmet. He began to glow, and I knew enough about gods to avert my eyes before he revealed his true div divine form. And with a brilliant white flash, he was gone, and I was alone with the horses. I stared at the blue envelope in my hands. It was addressed in strong but elegant handwriting, that I'd seen once before on a package Poseidon had sent me last summer. Percy Jackson, CO, Camp Half-Blood, Farm Road, 3.141, Long Island, New York, 1194. An actual letter from my father. Maybe he would tell me I'd done a good job of getting the fleece. He'd explained about Tyson or apologize for not talking to me sooner. There were so many things that I wanted that letter to say. I opened the envelope and unfolded the paper. Two simple words were printed in the middle of the page. Brace yourself. The next morning, everybody was buzzing about the chariot race. Though they kept glancing nervously toward the sky like they expected to see the Stymphalian birds gathering, none did. It was a beautiful summer day with the blue sky, plenty of sunshine. The camp had started to look the way it should look. The meadows were green and lush. The white columns gleamed on the Greek buildings. Dryads played happily in the woods, and I was miserable. They've been lying awake all night thinking about Poseidon's warning. Brace yourself. I mean, he goes to the trouble of writing a letter and he writes two words. Martha, the snake, had told me not to feel disappointed. Maybe Poseidon had a reason for being so vague. 
Maybe he didn't know exactly what he was warning me about, but since something big was about to happen, something that could completely knock me off my feet unless I was prepared. It was hard, but I tried to turn my thoughts to the race. As Annabeth and I drove onto the track, I couldn't help admiring the work Tyson had done on the Athena chariot. The carriage gleamed with bronze reinforcements. The wheels were aligned with magical suspensions, so we glided along with hardly a bump. The rigging for the horses was so perfectly balanced that the team turned at the slightest tug of the reins. Tyson had also made us two javelins, each with three buttons on the shaft. The first button primed with the javelin to explode on impact, releasing razor wire that would tingle and tread in an opponent's wheels. The second button produced a blunt, but still very painful, bronze spearhead designed to knock a driver out of his carriage. The third button, button brought up a grappling hook that could be used to lock onto an enemy's chariot or push it away. I figured we were in pretty good shape for the race, but Tyson still warned me to be careful, and the other chariot teams had plenty of tricks up their togas. You he said just before the race began. He handed me a wristwatch. There wasn't anything special about it, just white and silver clock face, a black leather strap. But as soon as I saw it, I realized that this is what I'd seen him tinkering on all summer. I didn't usually like to wear watches, who cared what time it was. But I couldn't say no to Tyson. Thanks, man. I put it on and found it was surprisingly light and comfortable. I could hardly tell I was wearing it. Didn't finish in time for the trip. Tyson mumbled, sorry, sorry. Hey man, no big deal. If you need protection in the race, he advised, hit the button. Uh, okay. I didn't see how keeping time was going to help a whole lot, but I was touched that Tyson was concerned. I promised him I'd remember the watch and, uh, and hey, um, Tyson, he looked at me. I want to say, well, I tried to figure out how to apologize for getting embarrassed about him before the quest. You're telling everyone he wasn't my real brother, and it wasn't easy to find the words. Uh, well, he sent you to help me, just what I asked for. I blinked. You asked Poseidon for... me? For a friend, Tyson said, twisting his shirt in his hands. Young Cyclopses grow up alone on the streets, learn to make things out of scraps, learn to survive. But that's so cruel. He shook his head earnestly. Makes us appreciate blessings, not be greedy and mean and fat like Polyphemus. But I got scared. Monsters chased me so much and clawed me sometimes. And the scars on your back. A tear welled in his eyes. Sphinx on 72nd Street. Big bully. I prayed to Daddy for help. Soon the people at Merriweather found me. Met you. Biggest blessing ever. Sorry I said Poseidon was mean. He sent me a brother. I stared at the watch that Tyson had made me. Percy, Annabeth called. Come on. Chiron was at the starting line, ready to blow the conch. Tyson, I said. Go, Tyson said. You will win. I, yeah, okay, big guy. We'll win this one for you. I climbed on board the chariot and got into position, just as Chiron blew the starting signal. The horses knew what to do. We shot down the track so fast I would have fallen out if my arms had been wrapped, hadn't been wrapped in leather reins. Annabeth held on tight to the rail. The wheels glided beautifully. We took our first turn a full chariot length ahead of Clarice, who was busy trying to fight off the javelin attack from the Stoll brothers in the Hermes chariot. We got him, I yelled, but I spoke too soon. Incoming, Annabeth yelled. She threw her first javelin in grappling hook mode, knocked away a lead weight, lead-weighted net that would have entangled us both. Apollo's chariot had come up on her flank, and before Annabeth could rear rearm herself, the Apollo warrior threw a javelin right into our wheel. The javelin shattered, but not before snapping some of our spokes. Our chariot lurched and wobbled. I'm sure the wheel would collapse altogether, but somehow we kept going. I urged the horses to keep up speed, and we were now neck and neck with Apollo. The Fetus was coming up close behind, Ares and Hermes were falling behind, riding side by side as Clarice went sword on javelin with Connor Stoll. If we took one more hit to our wheel, I knew we would capsize. You're mine, the driver from Apollo yelled. He was a first year camper. He didn't remember his name, but he sure was confident. Yeah, right, Annabeth yelled back. She picked up her second javelin, a real risk considering we had one full lap to go, and threw it at the Apollo driver. Her aim was perfect. 
Javelin threw a heavy spear point just as it caught the driver in the chest, knocking him against his teammate and sending them both toppling out of their chariots in a backward somersault. The horses felt the reins go slack and went crazy, riding straight for the crowd. Campers scrambled for cover as the horses leaped to the corner of the bleachers and the golden chariot flipped over. The horses galloped back toward their stable, dragging the upside-down chariot behind them. They held our own chariot together through a second turn, despite the groaning of the right wheel. We passed the starting line and thundered into our final lap. The axle creaked and moaned, and the wobbling wheel was making us lose speed, even though the horses were responding to my every command, running like a well-oiled machine. The Hathaya's team was still gaining. Beckendorf grinned as he pressed a button on his command console. Steel cables shot out of the front of his mechanical horses, wrapping around our back rail. Our chariot shuddered as Beckendorf's winch system started working, pulling us backward while Beckendorf pulled himself forward. Annabeth cursed and drew her knife. She hacked at the cables, but they were too thick. Can't cut them, she yelled. The Hephaedus chariot was now dangerously close. The horse is about to trample us underfoot. Switch me, I told Annabeth. Take the reins. But... Trust me. She pulled herself to the front and grabbed the reins. I turned, trying hard to keep my footing and uncap trying hard to keep my footing and uncapped rope tied. I slashed down and the cable snapped like kite string. We looked forward, but Beckendorf's driver just swung his chariot to our left, pulled up next to us. Beckendorf drew his sword and slashed at Annabeth, and I parried the blade away. We were coming up on our last turn. We never make it. I needed to disable the Hephaestus's chariot and get back up and get out of the way, but I had to protect Annabeth too. Just because Beckendorf was a nice guy didn't mean he wouldn't send us both to the infirmary if we let our guard down. We were neck and neck now, Clary's coming up from behind, making up for lost time. See, Percy, Beckendorf yelled, here's a little uh, parting gift. He threw a leather pouch into our chariot. It stuck to the floor immediately and began billowing green smoke. Greek fire, Annabeth yelled. I cursed. I'd heard stories about what Greek fire could do. I figured we had maybe 10 seconds before it exploded. Get rid of it, Annabeth shouted, but I couldn't. Hephaedus' chariot was still alongside, waiting until the last second to make sure their little present blew up. Beckendorf was keeping me busy with his sword. If I let my guard down long enough to deal with the Greek fire, Annabeth would get sliced and we'd crash right away. I tried to keep the leather pouch away with my foot, but I couldn't. It's, it was stuck fast. Then I remembered the watch. Didn't know how it could help, but I managed to punch the stopwatch button. Instantly, the watch changed. It expanded, and a metal rim spiraling out like an old-fashioned camera shutter. A leather strap wrapping around my forearm until I was holding a round war shield four feet wide. The inside soft leather, the outside polished bronze and graved with designs. I didn't have time to examine. All I knew was that Tyson had come through. I raised the shield, and Beckendorf's sword clanged against it. His blade shattered. What? He shouted, how? I didn't have time to say more because I knocked him in the chest with my new shield and sent him flying out of his chariot, tumbling in the dirt. I was about to use Riptide to slash at the driver when Annabeth yelled, Percy! The Greek fire was shooting sparks. I shoved the tip of my sword under the leather pouch and flipped it up like a spatula. The firebomb dislodged and flew into her face as chariot at the driver's feet. He yelped. In a split second, the driver made the right choice. He dove out of the chariot, which careened away and exploded in green flames. The metal horses seemed to short circuit. They turned and dragged the burning wreckage back toward Clarice and the Stoll brothers, who had to swerve to avoid it. Annabeth pulled the reins for the last turn. I held on sure we would capsize. But somehow she brought us through and spurred the horses across the finish line. The crowd roared. Once the chariot stopped, our friends mobbed us. They started chanting our names, but Annabeth yelled over the noise. Hold up, listen, it wasn't just us. The crowd didn't want to be quiet, but Annabeth made herself heard. We couldn't have done it without somebody else. We couldn't have won this race or gotten the fleece or saved Grover or anything. We owe our lives to Tyson, Percy's brother. I said loud enough for everybody to hear. Tyson, my baby brother. Tyson blushed. The crowd cheered and Annabeth planted a kiss on my cheek. The roaring got louder and louder after that. The entire Athena cabin lifted me and Annabeth and Tyson onto their shoulders and carried us towards the winner's platform where Chiron was waiting to bestow the laurel wreaths. All right, that is the end of chapter 18 and 19. We have one more chapter left.